We're in our series called Out Fox, and we're at the end of the series uh, called Out Fox. And during this, we've been looking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is identifying several spiritual snares that he wants his hearers to avoid. And so he talks about how there are two ways. And he says, one way is broad, it leads to death and destruction. Another way is narrow, and it leads to life. And we talked about how we're to avoid the spiritual snare of the misled majority. And the next week in our series, we talked about Jesus saying that, that there are some false teachers, some false prophets, as well as some true ones, right? And, uh, and so we talked about the spiritual snare of the inauthentic authority and how it is that we're to avoid that by looking at their fruit and, uh, and identifying what kind of tree they are. Well, this week... Jesus kind of turns the tables a little bit, and he wants us to look at ourselves. And so we're going to talk about the spiritual snare of hidden hypocrisy. And if we will, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. We'll have it on the screens, or you can open up your devices. And, uh, and here's what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, that anytime you see a, a double title or a double name, sometimes Jesus says, Martha, Martha, it's this earnest plea that happens. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I think one of the things that hits us right away, even if we might not necessarily notice it, but subconsciously it's there, Jesus is central to this passage. Jesus is central to Judgment Day. Jesus is central to eternity, right? And so when Jesus talks about this, he's, he's saying, People will say to me, Lord, Lord, and I will tell them, and they never knew me. And we recognize that all of judgment, which means also all of our human life, is about what our response to Jesus is, right? I think a lot of people read this passage with fear or concern, um, I, I know a lot of friends and other Christians, and I was just talking about to somebody before service who's telling me about someone they know that struggled with this passage, but I've had people say, how do we know that we won't get to the end? And Jesus will say, I never knew you, right? That's our fear, at, at least for many of us that we know. And um, I remember one time in Baltimore, Maryland, where I'm from, my brother and I were driving around the neighborhood. My brother was driving, and we got to this three-way stop, and we stopped at the stop sign. We saw another car coming, and so we stopped. We started to go again, because we knew they had a stop sign, and then we noticed they're not slowing down, right? And so we stopped again, and sure enough, they were blowing right through their stop sign, only they rolled down their window and said, you have a stop sign! And we're very mad at us for our false start. And I think sometimes when we read that passage, it's kind of like that, where we're like, what if, man, we think we're right, but, but they're actually right. What if we're actually the ones in the wrong? How do we know? Just like that person failed to recognize that, yes, we did have a stop sign, but they also had a stop sign too. Well, there's a test that we can apply, and I think Jesus brings out two major statements that bring a lot of clarity. The first one, he says, those who do the will of my Father in heaven, and the second thing he says is they never knew me. And so there's two things that seem awfully important here. It's that one, we would do the will of the Father who's in heaven, and two, that we would know Jesus, right? And what does it mean to do the will of the Father in heaven? How do I know if I've done his will enough? How do I know if I've done good works or, or if my good works outweigh my bad, when do I stop prophesying and doing miracles and exercising demons? How do I know? And I think that is what creeps in and that's exactly what creeped in for the false disciples that Jesus is talking about, uh, a works-based theology. 
And you know this because their response to Jesus is, but look at what we've done. Look at how we've cast out demons. Look at how we've done miracles in your name. Look at how we've prophesied in your name. When you read Acts chapter 19, this same exact thing happens, but Jesus is teaching about it in Matthew. We see it happen to the early church. Acts chapter 19, the fascinating passage that is just a, a parallel of what Jesus says will happen. Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 16 says this, some Jews who went, out, went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. I love that there are people that have heard about how effective Jesus' name is, and they've picked up at least on that part. And he says, they would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, I love the nuance here, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about. Little slight difference there, Jesus they know, he's the Christ, and Paul they know about. But who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. That last sentence happens awfully fast. They ran out of the house naked and bleeding. I'm trying to picture seven brothers who are in a tangle with a man and can't get out of the house and somehow they all end up naked and bleeding by the time they're able to get away from him. But I imagine they would have gotten to the end of their life and they would have said, Jesus, we use your name. We prophesied. We, we cast out demons in your name. We did things on your behalf. We surely make it. And Jesus would say to them, no. So there's, there's two tests that I want to talk about this morning. So for how you and I can know if Jesus would say that to us or not. Two tests. The first one is this. How is it that you plan on spending eternity with God? And I don't mean how do you plan on spending your time once you get there. I mean what do you place your hope in as far as what decides whether or not you make it, right? And so here's the key. God is not, prim the gospel is not primarily something that you do, but the gospel is primarily something that you receive. The shortest way to explain the gospel is just to say that Jesus saves you from your sin. But if we were gonna extrapolate upon that a little bit, we might say that God created you made you in his image, wants to be in a relationship with you. That was the design for your life. And that because sin entered the world and entered your life, that sin separates you from Jesus. And there's nothing that you can do to make yourself righteous. There's nothing that you can do to make yourself innocent. And that sin separates you from God and leads to spiritual death and is hopeless. And Jesus comes and he does what we cannot. And he pays the wages of our sin for us so that if we repent and believe, we can be forgiven and we can be seen through his righteousness, right? That's the gospel in a nutshell. So what does it mean to do the Father's will? Well, primarily, the Father's primary will is that we would place our faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation, that we would repent and believe in his name. And you see it all throughout the pages of scripture. I don't want you to just take my word for it, so I'm going to read from John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. It's going to be familiar for some of you, and, uh, and I want to show you just one of the places where scripture talks about God's plan for salvation. John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one 
and only Son. So the good news is not something that you do, but it's something that you receive. It's not something that you do, but it's something that's been done for you, primarily. Uh, you do obviously live for the kingdom and live out kingdom principles, but primarily the gospel is something that we receive, something that we couldn't do that was done for us. And I think if you know that about Jesus, then you know the real Jesus. So I was in um, Minneapolis at my last church working in the office, and we had a bus stop outside of our office. And the bus stop came, bus came, dropped somebody off, and they got out and they came into the office, and they said, um, hey, I need a ride to my interview. I'm an hour late, and I don't know how to get there, and I've been on the bus for way too long, and I saw that you're a church, and I knew that you would have to give me a ride. And I said, well, I can't argue with that logic, I guess. And I said, all right, let's get in my car. So we got in my car, and we're driving along. And he starts talking to me about um, how he's an apostle or an evangelist or, or something. And so I'm like, okay, that's great. Well, do you know what the word gospel means? And he, and he says, no. And I say, okay, well, it means good news. Do you know what the good news of Christianity is? And he says, yeah. That, um, you know, we read the Bible and read God's word and do what it says. And, and if we do, we'll be saved. And I said, okay, I can't really argue with that. But if I were in a car accident and bleeding out on the side of the road and you stopped and, and you came to help and you saw that it was fatal and I told you I need to be right with God, how do I get to heaven? What would you say to me? And he said, well, I would tell you you need to read God's word and do what it says. And I said, Man, I don't think there's time for that in this situation, right? Uh, raise your hand if, you, if you're aware of a man named Ray Comfort. Ray Comfort is a Christian, and uh, Ray Comfort, he's an interesting guy. He's, uh, I think he's from New Zealand originally, but he walks the beaches and boardwalks of California. And I'm fascinated by him because he strikes up conversations with strangers, and he has a really hard conversation with them about the gospel. And so he'll, he'll approach people. In California, atheists, agnostics, Wiccans, I mean, everybody that's willing to. And, uh, and he'll say, hey, can I ask you a question? They say, sure. He says, if you were to die today, where would you go, heaven or hell? And the vast majority of them say heaven. And he says, why do you think that? And they say, well, because I'm, I'm a good person. And, uh, and if God is a God of love, then I'm sure he'll let me in. And he says, can we put that to the test? And they say, okay. And he says, okay, have you ever, we'll just look at the Ten Commandments, just a few of them. Have you ever told a lie before? And they say, yeah. He said, okay, how many lies have you told? He said, I have no idea. He say, okay, what do you call somebody who lies so many times they have no idea how many lies they've told? Oh, a liar? Okay. Have you ever stolen anything before? He say, yeah, uh, you know, I can, they usually name one or two things that they've stolen before. He says, what do you call somebody who steals? And they say, a stealer. And he says, no, I don't think so. And they go, oh yeah, a thief. And uh, you know, they're on camera, everybody's nervous, it's an awkward conversation. Okay, have you ever used God's name as a cuss word before? And they'll say, yes. And he says, well, that's called blasphemy. Uh, if you blaspheme, you're a blasphemer. Have you ever looked at anybody with lust before? And they say, yeah, we're on the beach in California every day, multiple times a day, right? And he says, okay, Jesus says if you look at a, at a person with lust in your heart, then you commit adultery with them in your heart. And he says, so I don't, you know, I don't think these things about you, but from what we've just said to each other, you are a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer. When you stand before the judge, are you going to be innocent or guilty? And they say, oh, by those standards, I guess guilty. And he says, it's just four of the Ten Commandments. They're pretty basic standards. And they say, okay, heaven or hell? And they say, hell. And all of a sudden, everything shifts because when we want to be judged based on our righteousness, myself included, everybody in this room, if we want to be judged based on our own righteousness, we just don't make it. We don't make the cut. There's not one of us that is good enough or righteous enough to make it, right? If you stand before a judge in a human court and you've done something, you committed a, a heinous crime, 
You can't also say, yes, but I give to charity. Yes, but look at the good things that I've done. That doesn't hold up when it comes to whether or not you're guilty of committing a crime. And so if our basis for salvation is the fact that we're good people, we've totally missed the gospel, which means that we do not know Jesus because that is the core of who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. So if we say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? He will say, I never knew you. And with that understanding, I want to just reread Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, so we see very clearly what's happening here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now here's the second test. We said there were two. This next one's much quicker. How are you spending your now with God? How are you spending your now with God? There's this passage in the letter to the Corinthians where Paul writes to the Corinthians and he shares the gospel and he says, if the gospel has truly made its way into your heart, you will live differently and you will live for Jesus and I want to show that to you because it's so important for us 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verses 14 to 15 for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. That's different than than just calling Jesus Lord and doing these demonstrative works for him. That's different. Somehow we recognize the sacrifice and the love of Jesus, all that he's done for us, and it compels us to live for him. There's a, N.T. Wright is a, a famous biblical scholar and, and commentator, and he, he shares a story about a woman who wins a trip to travel the world. Three weeks, all expenses paid, trip of a lifetime. She's won some sort of lottery, and she cancels it. And, and it's such a big deal that all the news outlets at the time pick it up. And, and people reach out to her for interviews and they start to question her. And, and why have you canceled this amazing trip, this trip of a lifetime, this experience that most people want? And she says, and I'm just going to paraphrase her, but she says that um, her friend is dying. And she said, this friend, she loves her dearly. This friend was there for her when she was an addict. This friend was the only one who stuck by her when she was going through withdrawal and recovery. This friend cleaned up her vomit. This friend took her to the hospital. This friend was the only one that believed in her. And she said, so it didn't seem like a difficult choice for me. I wanted to be with her. And I knew that she didn't have much longer to live. You also get the sense from her that had she gone on that trip, she wouldn't have been able to enjoy it. And I think, man, that's what it's like when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, that we recognize that all the divine attributes that are true of the Father are true of the Son. And so you look at the Father, especially in the Old Testament, if you touch his mountain, you die. If you touch his ark, you die. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And at that time, if you had spoken to a king without getting permission to speak to a king, without being asked first, you would die. And so they have all of these amounts of respect and honor for the Father. And all of that can be applied to Jesus. And Jesus, God the Son, condescends, takes on flesh, is born in a feeding trough for animals in this manure place filled with fecal matter. I mean, and he's God the Son, and he starts off life suffering and being limited, and he lives through people 
that will doubt him, that will accuse him, that will tear him apart literally and he'll be tortured and he will suffer and die for us and and we recognize that God does that for each one of us because he loves us and values us and so and so he sets us free and he makes a way where we couldn't where we were hopeless and man now I get to live for him and if I allow that to affect myself so deeply there does become a point where I go yeah, there was sin in my life that I used to be attracted to and things that I used to enjoy, but man, I just wouldn't be able to enjoy them knowing that God doesn't enjoy them, knowing that God takes no pleasure in them. All of a sudden, we just, we're compelled to live for Jesus because of his love for us. And so that's the test. Man, do I, do I want to know if I truly know Jesus? Well, where do you base your salvation on? Is it your works and your righteousness or is it Christ's? Because that's the primary will of the Father. And then all the rest of that stuff will come after. And so that's what God is, is asking of us this morning. And uh, man, what an amazing blessing it is to be able to respond to that and know that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I've heard your gospel preached and proclaimed. And where your gospel is proclaimed, there your spirit is working mightily. And so, Father, even now we feel your presence. And God, we, we pray, Lord, that the truths that were said today, that we would allow them to sink deeply into our souls. God, pray that not one person here would make the mistake of thinking that salvation is based on whether or not they're good people. God, may all of us place all of our hope and salvation in Christ's righteousness and his sacrifice alone. God, on that day, may we say, yes, but we know Jesus. Yes, but we believe in Jesus. Yes, but judge us not on our righteousness, but on his righteousness. And Father, may we understand it so well that it begins to impact everything that we do. Lord, that we start learning to live for Jesus in every moment of our life. That's our prayer this morning, Lord. Hear our prayer. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and sing together.
reformer. He has an introduction to his commentary on Galatians. And he says at the end of it something like, we must continually beat the gospel into our heads. Amen. And I think that's so true for me. I need the gospel, but I also need to be reminded continually of the gospel because it's easy for me to forget. It's easy for me to get caught up in thinking that it's all about my works and my productivity and what I can do to serve the Lord. And, 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 and the gospel says, no. Man, that's such good news that the onus is not on me. That's such good news that I am, that I was a sinner and now I'm saved. That I was guilty and I've been pardoned. That I was, that I ran away and now I'm adopted. Whatever salvation metaphor you want to use, you were dead and now you're raised to new life. And so all of us can walk out of here going, I am right with God. I've been, I've been made white as snow. I'm washed clean by the blood of Jesus. And there's nothing that I could do. I had an insurmountable debt that I couldn't afford to pay back. Not in a million lifetimes. And it's been paid for me. Man, that is such good, incredible news that each one of us can walk out of here made right with God that he knows us and loves us and that we know him and love him. And it's all based on what Jesus has done for us, not what we've done. So it's not something that I can lose. It's not something that I can, I can go, God, I don't know if I've made it. I don't know if I'm good enough. You're a daughter of God. You're a son of God. And you're right with him. That's a message that I need to hear continually it's a message that you need to hear continually. It's a message that everybody outside of this building needs to hear. And so we'll end our service today like we do every day, every week. The worship service is over. Let's go be the church. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great and a blessed week.